been at this for the last couple of years, and I'm so pleased that you decided to take some time to come here this afternoon and to learn a little bit about uh, what I've learned, uh, maybe to share some things that I don't know, because I'm constantly learning about this, uh, but then to finish with uh, uh, a little bit about what this uh, Soames Heritage Area Project is all about. I live in Warren. Anybody recognize Burrs Hill Park? Yeah. Okay. I live in the house right back up there. It's actually on Water Street. It's a little white house over the bridge. Okay. Um, and you might think, uh, if I, since I've lived here since 1980, that in those, what, 40, 38 years, <laughs> no, how many, 39 years, that I would learn, have learned something about the history of Warren. But like most people who live here, you know, you just live here, you go about your life, you don't think about it. But then an interesting thing happened uh, two years ago, a year, a year ago May, so May of 17, when town showed up with a, uh, an excavator and began digging a hole. Anybody know what that was all about? Oh, yeah. Okay, what is that? They were uh, re reinterring Massasoit. Right. And I'm going to use the term the Massasoit, um, and I've had a lot of, generated a lot of controversy about this, but Massasoit is a title, it's like president, okay? So we say the president did something, right? Or President Eisenhower, so we say Massasoit Osamiquin, and Osamiquin is his name, and if you go over to the monument that's there in Burrs Hill Park, uh, um, we'll talk more about that, you will see Osamiquin, and it's, a, the O is an interesting O, I think it's a it's Greek like letter, pardon me? Looks like, looks, looks, looks like an eight, but yeah. it's pronounced Osamiquin, and there are five or six spellings, uh, because as you may know, the, the native people here did not have a written language, so it was really up to the Europeans to try to figure out how to write what they were saying. So that got me curious. I had been curious before, uh, about 15 years ago, when I learned about the Hugh Cole Well. Anybody know where that is? Yes. Off the bike path behind the Kikamiwa Middle School. Okay? And that had been there for years. In fact, it was put there, I think, 1917. Um, but the uh, bronze plaque was missing from it. So being a member of the Conservation Commission, along with Wendy uh, over there, um, we uh, decided to put a new plaque up there, and uh, the, fortunately the family uh, donated the money for a, not a bronze plaque, it's a plaque that looks like it's bronze, but it's plastic, uh, because the bronze ones get pried off uh, to the metal. Okay? Uh, so we got the plaque and had a little ceremony, installed it, etc., and um, that became part of my uh, King Philip War um, website, uh, which I was, learning something about the King Philip War in particular around here. Um, not the whole war, but just the sites in, in uh, the neighborhood. But then I went to a lecture by this woman over here, um, Helen Jader, T-J-A-D-E-R, uh, from Barrington. And Helen had started about four years earlier on a project uh, about what she called the Soames Heritage District. And she did a little four minute video, which you can see on the website. But she kind of got me thinking about this. And then I retired. And you know what happens when you retire. <laughs> you can't uh, wait. <laughs> that's right. So I you know, got busy on this and really did a lot of exploration. Um, so Helen explained that uh, the people who lived here were not what we're familiar with, the Wampanoag tribe. You've all heard that, okay? It's the Wampanoags who were here. Well, in my research, I found out that the name Wampanoag never appeared anywhere until 1702. Uh, but prior to that time, the people who lived here called their area, their territory, Poconokan. And that was a geographic name for uh, this area. And if you look at a map that uh, Thomas Bicknell did around the turn of the 20th century, you will see Poconoke. They didn't have names for their tribes. They were the people. 
you know, you go around saying I'm, you know, I, you know, I'm a Warrenite or whatever. I mean, you describe yourself um, in terms that other people understand, and the way the English understood it, uh, Poconocet was the tribe that lived in the Poconocet lands. Okay, but there was also an area called Psalms, and a lot of debate over where Psalms is, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, but. If you ever notice on the, the frieze, the, the stonework on the, over the door of town hall, right next door to us here, you will see the word Psalms, uh, an Indian head and in, unfortunately a Western Indian uh, headdress, which is totally wrong, uh, but the year 1621. Okay? And I hope before you leave here, you'll all know why we call the Psalms and why we uh, what 1621 means. But as Holland explained, uh, the Poconocet land really extends way up uh, um, toward uh, the Massachusetts tribe uh, that occupied Boston, extends over into western Providence, okay, uh, to New Deconocet Hill, and down south, this whole coastline, Buzzards Bay, etc., and the two islands. Uh, so they had an extensive territory, and that was the territory uh, that the Massasoit Osinequin was um, sort of chief of chiefs, if you will. Uh, there were many chiefs, there were about 31 tribes down here, uh, but there were uh, various kinds of uh, uh, tribes that lived within that area. So for 10,000 years, at least, possibly a little longer, we know the glaciers receded 12,000 years ago, so we couldn't live here, it was covered with ice. But sometime around 10,000 years, people began moving into the area. Not in large numbers, uh, but like all people, they moved here for a place to live and for food. And uh, the area around here was a rich land for food and had water access for food as well. Any of you, anybody dig clams around here? <laughs> Oops. Uh, you can't live in an area without food, and these are people who were hunter-gatherers, uh, so you had to move to find the food, uh, either hunting grounds uh, further inland, but a rich coastline with all kinds of seafood that you could easily access year-round, except when the river's frozen over completely. Uh, so they were very successful until who arrived in the in the uh, 16th century, in the 1500s. Uh, all kinds of people would come on these, what the native people saw as floating islands, would come in and a few men would get off and trade. Okay? Uh, occasionally they did things that they shouldn't have done in terms of capturing some of the natives and took them back to Europe and one thing or another. Uh, but the main thing is until 1620, no one brought women and children. That was what was different for the first time, and the native people here thought, oh, this is going to be a problem. Okay. And they were right. First of all, some of those people who came here to trade not only brought uh, items uh, uh, to trade, European items, what we would call trinkets, uh, you know, and some knives and beads and things of that sort, uh, but they also brought contagious diseases diseases that the people who lived in this area had never been exposed to. And because of that, they were highly susceptible. We don't know precisely what the diseases are, but there's been speculation of everything from uh, smallpox to the plague. Okay. But, and there may have been several uh, uh, kinds of diseases as well. 90% of the people living on the coastal area here died between 1616 and 1619. We might as well have had a nuclear bomb dropped on this area, as far as the population goes, okay? The native people did not know what it was. They tried all of their medicine and every approach they could, but the medicine men were dead. There was nobody to help. They couldn't even bury the bodies. So when the pilgrims arrived in 1620, they found the shoreline littered with bleached bones because the, the people were left here. It, but how did they take that? A sign from God. He has prepared the way. So in they came. Meanwhile, 
Massasoit, who was living either in Warren, Barrington, this area, decided he'd better go see what he could work out because he had the Narragansett tribe just on the other side of the bay breathing down his neck and very interested in coming to this part of the area to access the food and everything of that sort. Uh, so he needed to, an alliance. Um, he struck an alliance. This is a couple of different uh, uh, views of what Osamequin may have looked like. We do not know. He was simply described as a lusty man. That means a muscular man. Um, this is a more contemporary uh, uh, illustration uh, with his red uh, horseman's jacket that was given to him by Edward Winslow and a uh, copper necklace. Um, so what did he do? He did what any good leader would do under these circumstances and struck a treaty. Uh, the Wampanoag Treaty, so-called, of 1621 is commemorated uh, by the United States government on a, the back of a coin. Anybody have a Sacagawea coin? Okay, a dollar coin? Well, look on the back and you will find the Wampanoag Treaty. That's it. I cannot find any other reference to the Wampanoag Treaty, you know, in terms of the U.S. government's acknowledgement of what happened there. But that was probably the most significant uh, document and uh, action that took place on the, the, the coast of North America that, because it ensured the survival not only of Massasoit and his, the Massasoit and his people, but also of the colonists. Because as you recall, half of them died over the first winter. They didn't know how to plant and what to grow in this area, had no way of producing food, knew very little about hunting except with guns, uh, and they weren't very good at it. Uh, but the native people were and taught them how to grow food, how to harvest food from the sea, and how to hunt successfully. That ensured their survival. A little later on, uh, they began trading in furs. When the pilgrims first came here, they thought they were going to pay back their debt. Remember, they, they borrowed money to get over here. And they were under contract uh, to bring back fish and wood, which both of which England needed desperately. They had cleared the English island of wood. Um, but they discovered furs, beaver furs in particular, which was highly lucrative in the uh, European market, at least for another 20 years. Uh, so that became the principal uh, source of trade. Um, Ed Winslow, very important figure. Um, Fascinating guy, and somebody you can read all about. Um, this is his portrait up at the uh, uh, Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth. Um, the only, and that was done while he was alive, so we have a pretty good idea that's what it looked like. Uh, but um, he decided that uh, this Massasoit guy is really important to us, and we need to have a better relationship with him. So he and a couple of uh, his buddies came down here about 40 some miles from. Imagine walking from Plymouth to here, okay? That's what he did. It was in July, so it was a little nicer then. And, uh, um, but he was able to come and find Osamequin's village here, um, which he called Psalms or Somerset. Um, and you can read a wonderful account on that. Just go to uh, go online and you'll find, uh, just uh, Google Ed Winslow and Osamequin, and you'll read the whole story in great detail about his trip down here. Um, he may have visited uh, a spring here. Uh, we don't know for sure. Virginia Baker, around the turn of the 20th century, decided that that was Massasoit Spring, and he must have lived right here in Warren, right? Um, any more evidence other than her conjecture? No. <laughs> and then Tom McNell, who uh, a few years later over in uh, Barrington said no, uh, he didn't live here, he lived over in Barrington. So, any, you're from Barrington? Who's from Barrington? Huh? I'm from Warren. Oh, okay. Any Barrington people here? I'll be happy to defend you. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of the matter is that the, the settlements did not stay in one place. They moved constantly. Uh, you know, to, to say that Massasoit only lived in Warren, you know, today's boundaries of Warren, is crazy. Same about Barrington. 
he, he went up to Middleborough to hunt during the summer. He went into the woods up in Norton in the wintertime to hunt. You know, it, it, there's no specific place, okay, but he occupied this territory. You can say Solmes and Warren or Barrington was the place that Winslow did meet with him and struck a good relationship. That became even more important when two years later, Winslow heard that Osamequin was ill, perhaps um, on death's door. So he got another group together uh, um, at um, um, Hampton and, and others, about five or six of them, I believe. Um, and they, again, walked the 40-some uh, mile trail down to here. And Winslow finds Osamequin uh, blind, um, unable, barely able to talk, and uh, those around him thought that he was about to die. Winslow, like most English leaders in that time, had to have a knowledge of medicine. They did not have a doctor on board the ship, uh, the Mayflower. Uh, if somebody was sick, you had to do the best you could with the remedies you had. So that's what Winslow did. He applied his remedies, which essentially, you can read the description, it's like chicken soup, okay? Uh, and he scraped his tongue and you know a bunch of other things. Well, lo and behold, the Massasoit recovers. Okay. Well, if you think if you think they weren't friends enough beforehand, at this point they were lifetime friends. There was nothing that Winslow or the English could do that would undo the bond of friendship between the two of them after that event. Uh, so when Winslow went back, uh, he told people that. Massasoit was alive, good thing, and that uh, they can continue their treaty relationship, which guaranteed that each would protect the other, and that came in handy on several occasions. So, what did this area probably look like back then? Uh, we didn't have any cameras then, so we can only imagine, but it's described as an open land. And what I did was just take some Google Maps of uh, Warren and and uh, Barrington here, and erase all the buildings, <laughs> and uh, paint in uh, some open fields. Uh, the fields were open, by the way, because the native people here for generations had been burning areas around here, uh, spring and fall, to keep the lands open. Now, that sometimes meant that there were open fields, but it also meant that there were wooded forests with large trees, chestnut, oak, you know, the, the big trees that have been around for hundreds of years. When the fires go through, they just burn out the brush mm -hmm. un underneath. And they, you know, you do this on a windy day. You know, California probably understands all this. And you just burn off the underbrush. So if you're hunting, it's easy to walk through the woods and you can see your prey, the deer. Uh, so if you can imagine this area as an open, cleared space, you get some idea of what things might have looked like 400 years ago. There's one very brief record of a visit to an, what was called an English house, which others have translated to as a, uh, um, a, uh, a trading post. Uh, again, probably on near Tyler Point, though opinions vary. Some people put it over on the Kikamui. Somewhere around here in 1632, uh, they were uh, um, had enough furs that the native people brought to the trading post and enough wampum that the uh, English were using to purchase those furs that a trading post made good sense. Uh, this, by the way, is the Hoxie House uh, trading post that you can see. It's a uh, recreation, if you will, in, uh, in the Cape. Uh, one of the people who came here to visit was uh, none other than the uh, uh, Miles Standish, you've probably heard of him. Uh, he was one of the military leaders on, on the Mayflower. And he came to this open area and said, wow, this is terrific. And he described it as, uh, Solmes, as the garden of a patent. The patent was uh, what the king had granted in terms of the use of the land. Uh, and the flower, F-L-O-U-R, of the garden, so much for English spelling at the time. Uh, but think of him as a real estate agent. I've been there, I've seen it, it's wonderful. Well, as that news began to circulate among the pilgrims who were now well settled in Plymouth and had begun establishing towns 
um, Weymouth and uh, Taunton and uh, down at Dartmouth, and they were very interested in this land. But uh, another guy showed up here. Anybody recognize this one? Yeah. Uh, Roger, uh, our friend Roger Williams. Uh, fascinating story, I won't tell you the whole thing, but basically he was living up in Salem, uh, having already met Osamequin down here when he did a brief two-year stint down at uh, Plymouth as an ordained pastor, minister. But why was he getting into trouble all the time? He had some pretty strange ideas about uh, uh, the church and about uh, government and how one shouldn't be the other and uh, really kind of got people in the Massachusetts Bay Colony kind of riled up. So they said, uh, you're out of here. And in uh, January, imagine this time of year, in 1636, uh, the uh, uh, authorities and uh, the governor in the Mass Bay Colony said, you're going back to England. We're not keeping letting you stay here. And that's pretty much what he did. Uh, he, he left, but he didn't go to England. He came down here to where his friend Osamequin was and as far as we know, was sheltered somewhere. This is somewhat apocryphal. Uh, we don't, he just has one sentence in which uh, Roger describes in a letter that he wrote in 1670 about how he spent 14 weeks, uh, didn't know food or drink. Um, uh, and we know it was in January. We also know from other reports that it was a horrible January. So he had trekked all the way down from Salem uh, here and ended up being sick. So we, we believe that Osamequin uh, engaged one of his wives, Margaret, uh, to care for him. And we believe, this is apocryphal, uh, that the spot that that occurred was a place called Margaret's Cave. Anybody know where that is? Is that one of the three? It's not, not far, uh, just over the Warren border. Yeah. Okay. If you go up Birch Swamp Road, okay, all the way to the end where it curves to go back, uh, to one, uh, 114 to Market <coughs> Street. If you were to go off to the right uh, into the woods about a half mile, uh, you would find this large rock. It's on private property, uh, but uh, the Williams family has uh, put a, a little marker there to uh, tell the story, and uh, uh, we occasionally lead walks of small groups of people uh, to the rock. It, you know, it's called a cave sometimes, not much of a cave, it's kind of an indented place at the end of a large outcropping. Is that you, the way Devil's Rock is? Uh, Devil's Rock is further back in the woods, but same area. Right? Um, if, you're, if you've got good eyesight or a pair of binoculars, uh, go up, uh, I'll talk to you about King's Rock sometime, up on 136 while the leaves are off the trees, and look all the way to the back of the field there, as far as you can see where the field stops, and through that line of trees there, you will see the rock that is Margaret's Rock. Okay, it's not that far away. It's not that uh, uh, out of the way uh, for people living in this area. So this is an area that few people know about. Uh, even fewer, it seems, know about uh, his landing spot when he left uh, Soames. Uh, and Osamequin suggested that he go up on what was an inlet now because it's closed off is Omega Pond. Anybody been to Omega Pond up in uh, East Providence? I've lived here for <laughs> almost, you know, almost 40 years and, and never went up there. I didn't know a thing about it. I started looking into it and discovered, in fact, there's a little marker at the back of the field there. This is Omega Pond. And here's a, a marker for Roger Williams Spring. That's where he and some settlers who came from Salem to join him spent that first um, uh, spring uh, probably April through June or so, uh, cleared some land, planted some crops, and were all ready to settle there. And if that had remained, that would be Providence today. But when the uh, authorities in Plymouth found out that he was still in their territory, they said, you must remove. <laughs> so that he did. And we know, some of us know the story of how he got in a canoe and went across the Seacock River and met uh, some Narragansett uh, Native people there who greeted him with uh, what cheer, Neetop, okay, hi friend, okay. 
And they suggest that you go around the river up the Mushasik River and settle where you will find the Roger Williams Memorial on the north end of uh, Main Street in Providence. And if you haven't been there, it's well worth a visit. Uh, the interpretive uh, center there and the little house at the end is great. They have good videos. And I won't tell you the whole story about Roger Williams because John McNiff, who is the ranger there, will tell you the whole story. And it's fascinating. Okay. There's a rock in James. Pardon me? There's a rock in Jamestown right down in the center. Yes. There's a rock in Jamestown where Roger Williams met Canonicus uh, to work out a treaty there. Okay. Uh, I don't focus on the West Bay, so you won't hear about all of that. Um, but um, also not far from the spring is uh, what we think is the, the second oldest house, the Philip Walker House. It's questionable whether there are parts of it that are before 1700. Uh, that's closed, unfortunately, while they're doing research on it. Uh, and there's a privately owned house just around the corner from the Ro Roger Williams Spring called the Daggett House. It's, uh, though it's privately owned, it's marked. Uh, and that's probably the oldest existing house in um, this area. Is that, okay. is that East Providence or Hobbit? East, East Providence, East right. Providence. It's on William Street. And if you, I'll pass out brochures at the end, and you, you can go on the website. All this stuff, everything you see here is documented on the website. Um, here's the Roger Williams Memorial uh, downtown, where Roger and his band stayed. Here's a, Here's somebody's concept of what uh, Providence looked like in 1650. Uh, this hill across this great salt pond, which has now been reduced to the, the little uh, um, you know, water fire uh, pond there, um, is where the state house is. Okay, you notice how the state house is up on a hill? Mm -hmm. I never understood Providence <laughs> until I learned about how Providence started and what was going on there. Um, there's a bridge downtown, Waybosset Bridge, at the bottom of College Street. Anybody ever read the interpretive signs on either end of it? I never did. Well, go look at them sometime. You'll learn a lot about how Providence started. And you'll learn that that was the, the center, if you will, of civilization before uh, Roger and his band got there because it was the only place that you could cross from the West Bay to the other side of Narragansett Bay without taking a boat. Uh, at least at low tide, uh, there was a crossing point there. You probably had to wade across, but uh, you know it's one way to get there. Well, the colonists decided to build a bridge there, and guess who the first toll taker was? Roger. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta make a living somehow. <laughs> well, that bridge washed out in the storm, one thing or another, they went back to wading for a while, then they built this is the eighth bridge that's been in that same location, okay? And you can get the whole story on the, on the web page. <coughs> Lots of changes took place here, and I'm not going to go over this in detail, but um, these are the land purchases that took place around here. Um, how many people know that Barrington was once Warren? Yeah. How many people know that Warren was once Swansea? Okay, a lot of you. So if you follow this along, the first purchase was called the Wanamoiset Purchase. Uh, there's a little marker for that. If you go up on Pawtucket Avenue, I was just there yesterday you gotta try to get a better picture of the marker. A little stone marker, you know, there's the Spring Hill Golf Course there, Spring something? Silver Spring. Pardon me? Silver Spring. Silver Spring, thank you. It, it, and it's best that you park there and walk because crossing Pawtucket Avenue is dangerous. <laughs> okay. But it's on the Gulf side and if you walk about 50 yards up from there you'll find a marker and that marked the first purchase of Psalms from from uh, Osamequin at that time 1645 um, so this was still all native territory here and then there was a second purchase which included much more of, uh, of uh, Barrington Notice Rehoboth up here, that, that was a purchase that was made in 1641, um, and that, that was actually a direct purchase from the king. It was uh, supposedly at eight miles square, it's actually 10 miles square, and that included uh, the Ring of the Green, if you're familiar with that, we'll take a look at a picture uh, a little later. Uh, but then gradually, then uh, by 1667, that's what you see when you cross 
in and out of uh, uh, Swansea, you see 1667. That was the purchase. And that's when this area that you're sitting in now was purchased. And then, not to leave things alone, uh, there was a, 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 a purchase uh, in 1717. Anybody know when the Barrington celebrated the 350th anniversary? <laughs> In 2017, right? Or 300th anniversary. Yeah, because there was there was Barrington in 1717, but then they lost it when it, in 1747. That's when a court decision simply drew a line on a map. I said, "What is with this state line? It makes no sense. Follows no rivers, natural courses, anything." Well, that was because somebody put a ruler on a map and said, "This is where the line is." And now we live with it. Okay, uh, but that then um, was still um, uh, Warren, which included a large part of what is now Barrington, and now you see what is now East Providence uh, coming down into there. And then finally, not till 1770, did Barrington get its own town and its own right, Warren its own town, Swansea its own town. Okay, and. Um, Bristol didn't become Bristol until when? No, no a little later. It came right after a major event called the King Philip War. Up until the King Philip War, the area south of Franklin Street here used to be a fence here uh, on what is essentially now Franklin Street that divided the native land. And at that time, this was called Brooks Pasture. Remember, it was just open land. Um, but south of there was all native land. And as you can see, if you're living down there and your numbers are diminishing in terms of the native people who are living here, uh, they're getting more and more surrounded by these English settlements. Okay? And if your population is going down and you're the, the territory that you have had for 10,000 years has shrunk to just this one little peninsula. How are you feeling at that time? Yeah, terrible, threatened, okay? And that's exactly what was going on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a group from Weymouth came down in 1643 after the land was purchased in 41. And uh, you people familiar with the Newman Church? Okay, uh, they just celebrated there at 300 and 75th anniversary up there. Uh, that was the earliest settlement. And uh, you see some of the graves on the other side, but gathered 1643, okay? So there are a number of churches around here from the 17th century. Um, not far from there uh, is the 10 Mile River. Everybody on this ring of the green, which is just a large uh, uh, common area uh, that's now filled by a cemetery. Um, everybody had uh, frontage on the ring, and then the back end of their property was either on uh, the Seekonk River or on the Ten Mile River. So it, pretty nice, huh? You've got woodlot, you get access to water, and you have access to the common. So uh, along the Ten Mile River, uh, shortly after this period of time, they began to build mills along there. And if you stop by, go down Pleasant Street sometime, you'll see a shingle hanging out there for the Hunts Mills. Uh, um, headquarters of the East Providence uh, Historical Society. Drive in there, take a look at the interpretive signs anytime, and get a good look at the Ten Mile River. It's a fabulous river. Uh, further north in Rehoboth, uh, there was a gathering that started uh, uh, prior to the King Philip War in roughly 1660. They also began building mills, but when the war broke out, they also built garrison houses, okay? Uh, on, none of them survived. Everything was burned in the war, but there are markers that tell you where things were. Uh, this is a map I put together for my King Philip War site, and this was to illustrate how you have English settlements all the way down here in Warwick and around, um, Newport especially, okay? There's a whole ring of English settlements now surrounding King Philip, or um, um, Osamequin's son, who, when Osamequin died in 
Some say 1661, I've got evidence it was 1660, but in any case, he was about 80 years old. When he passed away, um, the, his oldest son, uh, Alexander, or, um, um, was named the Massasoit, but he died within that first year, and the suspicion on the native part was that he was poisoned. Uh, so that didn't set things up very well. So his younger brother, um, Philip, um, Pometacom, you know, Medicom, you know, we use these street names all the time. Uh, he was in charge now of this dwindling tribe down here, and really fearful that the English were someday just going to invade and take over, and that would be the end of it. So, like in many situations like that, they began an effort to essentially drive the English back to Europe. Uh, there's no statement to that effect, but if you look at the, the, uh, the geography of uh, where this war went, where they started down here, and went way out to western Massachusetts. And I believe that the effort, had it continued, would have been to simply sweep right across and send everybody home. Uh, they'd had enough, uh, they wanted their land back, and this seemed to be the only way to do it. And if they didn't, they might all be some people call it genocide. I mean, there, there were such a diminishing uh, numbers of, of their population over that time that one can describe that. Well, this war broke out. I won't go through that. I can do another whole talk on the war. Only lasted a little less than two years. It started right here, we think, in Warren um, on uh, Joe Winslow's farm, which supposedly was just south of uh, Child Street and probably near the Kick of So if you get some rough idea, nobody knows for, for certain about that. But that, that war uh, broke out when uh, uh, the uh, colonists were uh, assembled at, at uh, church on Sunday, which they were required to do. And uh, some of the homes were burned. And then one of the young boys there shot one of the natives. And the next thing you know, we had 300 troops coming down from uh, Boston uh, for a militia. They gathered up uh, at the Miles Bridge. Anybody been to visit the, what was used to be called the Bungtown Bridge? I love that because <laughs> Bungtown was where they used to make the ships up there in Barneyville. Uh, but that, at that time, was the location where Reverend John Miles, who broke away from the Weymouth, uh, I'm sorry, from the, it was the Weymouth group, but from the uh, um, Newman Church, uh, and established uh, the first Baptist church in Massachusetts. And you can see the marker for that on George Street, uh, just across, uh, uh, not far from uh, Four Town Farm, if you're familiar with that. Okay? Um, but his garrison became the place where people um, uh, assembled in order to then go after Philip and chase him all the way down uh, through Bristol. Well. You know, that took them three, three days, four days before they were ready to go, and they were going to march uh, British style, you know, stand up, load, fire, you know, that kind of thing. Totally ineffective. Um, meanwhile, the uh, native warriors were picking them off one by one as, as they went down there. And by the time they got down to first uh, uh, one encampment at the Narrows and then uh, one at um, Mount Hope, Mount Top, uh, in Bristol, uh, no one was there. Um, so they burned whatever they could, and, and this is a long story in terms of what they did, but it wasn't a very good strategy. This um, Benjamin Church, uh, who was at the time living in the, um, Little Compton, was recruited to lead the rest of the war, and finally when he started adopting the guerrilla tactics that the native people were using, the war turned. Um, the Narragansetts had entered the war uh, following the Great Swamp Massacre, one of the worst things that have ever happened to an indigenous population where 400 men, women, and children were burned alive uh, by the English, and that got them into the war. Um, and they might have won the war. It wasn't all that certain that uh, the English were going to prevail, uh, but when they, by the spring of 76, when the native people were running out of food and ammunition because they couldn't grow food in the spring, and the English were the ones who supplied the ammunition. Um, they finally, uh, um, <clears throat> their effort collapsed, and they chased uh, uh, Philip down here to Bristol, 
And he, what happened to him in, in Bristol over in Mount Hope? In the Miry Swamp. He was shot by, interestingly, another native person who was on the side of the colonists, Alderman, um, and he died there in, in fine English fashion, which, remember, uh, uh, England at the time uh, was full of warfare and all kinds of things. It, they beheaded kings then, okay? Killing people publicly was a spectator sport there, okay? So what do they do to King Philip? They okay. cut off his head, cut off his hands and his feet, quartered him, uh, and then uh, paraded his head uh, all the way to Plymouth, and it stayed there on a pike for 20, 30 years or whatever. Uh, and we think all that's gruesome. Uh, people have grown up with that kind of stuff. You know? So that's, that's what happened. Immediately following the war, um, if you were Poconocan or spoke the Poconocan language, you could be shot if you were over the age of 14. They wanted them gone. Okay. Now, you can understand that. Their homes have been looted and burned, people have been killed. It's the bloodiest war in North America. 10% okay. uh, of the colonists have died in that war. 25 of uh, uh, villages, uh, uh, had, had native, uh, colonial villages, have been burned to the ground. Um, you can understand the feelings that they had. Um, but one of the reactions was to expunge the native population. Um, drive them out, kill them, uh, send them out of the area. Many went on their own to Maine or New York. Those remaining were, either some of them were enslaved if they were good Indians, as they say, um, in, as servants or slaves here. Uh, but many of them were uh, taken to Barbados uh, because if you enslave a native person up here, um, what happens if they want their freedom? They just leave. <laughs> Not a problem. And they know how to survive, okay? And, and they have connections. They've got other, they have places they know, etc. Who doesn't know the territory and can't survive that way? People from Africa, okay? So the enslaved people from Africa were brought to Barbados and traded for native people, and that's how enslaved people of, from Africa came into New England. And if you don't think slavery started in New England, you need to learn your history. It did. And it started with Native American enslavement and trade for African Americans. Okay. We could do a couple of hours on that. Um, so what's remaining here? And I'll, go quickly enough that we can have time for some questions. This is the Miles Garrison marker that's over at the Bungtown Bridge that I was telling you about. Okay, not hard to find. Um, there's a postcard picture of what the Garrison house, the house that was there, that's not the original Garrison. <laughs> okay. That was burned, but there was a house there until about uh, uh, early 1910 or something like that. Um, if you go down to Mount Hope uh, Farm, Go to the office there, tell them you're interested in seeing um, the uh, place where um, King Philip was shot. Uh, they will give you instructions of how to walk there. It's about a mile walk, and it's downhill, so it's uphill on the way back. Um, and if you work your way through, you'll find this marker still there in the swamp. Um, easiest thing to do is look at it in a picture. <laughs> It's not that remarkable, and that's all you're going to see there. Um, an easier rock to see is up in uh, Rehoboth on Route 44, Anawan Rock. Anybody been there? Yeah. Okay. That's an easy one to get to. There's a little trail, and you can see where, after Philip was killed, Anawan, his lieutenant, if you will, was captured there, and spent a couple days telling war stories back and forth with church, and. Church thought they were going to spare him, but he was sent to Plymouth and, and uh, executed there. So, um, but uh, that's probably the, the one place we know with absolute certainty that something happened uh, during the King Philip War. Um, burial grounds all over the place here. Who's from Swansea? Have you ever tried to get to the uh, Old Eddie burial ground? Don't try now. It's, it's practically <laughs> impossible. <laughs> Uh, but it's in the center of town there. Uh, I visited there years ago when the sign was still there. Uh, how about the ancient Little Neck Cemetery over in uh, East Providence? Been there, okay. Fascinating little place. Uh, it's at the north end of Bullock Cove. 
if you look on a map, uh, and there's directions on the, on the website how to get there. But it's a great little cemetery, 1655, okay? And not only uh, are some of the other colonists buried there, but also Thomas Willett. Remember, uh, we got the Juan Moisant purchase, he was part of that, okay? Willett was Dutch, and because he knew Dutch, was recruited to go down to New York City, which was just a little hole in the wall. And Newport was the, the going place then. New, New York was, New Amsterdam was not much of anything. But he was mayor there on two occasions uh, because of his knowledge of both the Native Americans and uh, the Dutch language. Kikamuit Cemetery, you've all been there, yeah, right? Yeah. On Serpentine yeah. Road, yeah. Not right? Fascinating there, that's one of our former governor, the, uh, the, the last colonial governor is buried there, but also uh, some of the uh, um, men who fought in the uh, King Philip War. And at Tyler Point, uh, Tyler Point Cemetery, Surrounded now by the by the uh, boatyard, Stanley boatyard there, but you can go in there, and uh, you'll find a marker. We don't know for certain where John Miles is buried, but he's the guy who had the the Miles Garrison, and you know, separated from the church in East Providence. And I love this one. This is uh, the uh, Obadiah Bowen Cemetery. I didn't find it till just last fall. It's up behind the Educational Collaborative on uh, Market Street. Yeah, you know, Schoolhouse Road, and yes. you know, if you go up Schoolhouse Road, maybe 100 yards, and go into the right, you'll find this. You know, it's practically impossible to see from the street, but there's a nice cemetery there, and some burials from prior to 1700. This is uh, one up in Rehoboth. Actually, there are a couple in Rehoboth with uh, 17 pre-1700 burials. A uh, few of the other places around. Uh, this is probably more familiar because it's in Warren. It's, uh, Chase Farm up on the north end of uh, the uh, um, Birch Swamp Road. Um, um, Joetta, who owns uh, the, the farm there, is a wonderful person, very interested in history, and is struggling very hard to keep that uh, farmland. You know, but you know, if, if you put your farmland in, in preservation, as she has, uh, no one can build on it. So she can't sell the land. She doesn't want to. But at the same time, she's got to make some money to keep the place going. It's not easy. Try, try farming sometime. If you go up to East Providence, there's the Brigham Farm area. It's another colonial period farm. Uh, Byron Key, anybody know Byron around here? Yeah. yeah. He has a farm, and he's pretty certain that uh, the house that was built there was pre-1700, but we don't. that hasn't been verified. Uh, but he finds uh, uh, native tools. This is a uh, like a mortar and pestle that's Mortar uh, that we found the, on the ground. A fascinating area over in uh, Tuisa. Um, other beautiful places to come and visit uh, over in um, um, Barrington is uh, Soames Woods. Uh, it's Echo Lake and the area around that that's now a natural preserve. You can walk around it, you can put a kayak in there. Um, and um, also in the middle of Barrington, uh, it's just over there yesterday, it's the uh, um, uh, Hampton. Meadows Greenbelt. There's a sign there, a couple of places you can park there. It's on Linden House Road. Um, kind of cuts across uh, the um, lower end of uh, New Meadow Neck. Um, but it's a great place. And we pass it preserve down in Bristol. The Bristolians. How many people have walked through We pass it preserve? You go down Narrows Road to the water, park your car there, there's plenty of room. And then walk up in the trail, and it goes for, I don't know, three quarters of a mile or so. But this wonderful woods that uh, it was probably cleared at some point, but it, it's about the closest you can get the way things were 400 years ago. There's a stream that runs through it, fabulous little place to walk around. And that's a land, a land trust area. Um, here's a place that you are probably familiar with because you drive by it all the time up on Market Street. You've seen that uh, big boulder up on the, uh, that's on Susan Landmark uh, property, the uh, D'Alessandro farmland there. Oh, yeah. ah. And I've driven by that thousands of times yeah. and said, what the heck is that? <laughs> well, I went over and talked to Susan and we did some exploration. I got some other people up there and one thing or another. I talked to Tim Ives, who's the archeologist for the state. And, and then I read a whole lot about something called perched or balanced rocks. Okay, I'll look them up. Uh, they're all over New England, a huge number of them in Connecticut, but none that I can find documented right around this area. So I talked to Tim. I said, Tim, 
is this big boulder that sits up on, on granite ledge at the top of a knoll that's been called Sachem's Knoll that we know was Wigwam Hill that Native American women used, were told uh, used to grind corn on King's Rock here, which is on the west side of Market Street, just south of Johnson's Market. Okay, get out of your car sometime and walk up on the rock and you will see a long um, moss-filled groove where we hear uh, that they rolled a stone to grind corn. Nobody knows for certain. Uh, but here's two items here that have the markings of a native establishment. So I said to Tim, what is that? And he said, oh, glacial erratic. Yeah, I know about glacial erratics. They're, they're all over New England. There's a wonderful one up uh, in Acadia, if anybody's been up there in Maine. It's this perched rock way up on the side of a mountain that looks like the thing's about ready to roll down the hill, but it doesn't. Um, that, I believe, is a, a glacial perched rock. I don't think anybody could have put that there. But do you think uh, 10 strong men could roll that rock? Yeah, probably. It could be a drum rock. You know about a drum rock over in Warwick. Where it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, you can look that up. There's a drum rock in Warren, which is a big perched rock that you rock back and forth, and because of its connection to rock underneath it, it makes a sound that can be heard for miles and miles around. I said, but Tim, there are rocks underneath this holding it up. Glaciers don't do that. <laughs> I said, people put those there. He said, well, it could have been some college kids in the 1930s decided to roll this rock up there. I said, yeah, right, Tim. Why would they do that? First of all, where'd they get the rock from? It's probably from some distance away. You would spend days or weeks trying to roll this on somebody's private farmland, and you would just happen to leave it on top of a glacial or a, a, a granite outcropping? I don't think so. I understand archaeologists go by the rules you can't say something is something until you have evidence for it. And there, has anybody heard of this? Anybody know what this is called? Any, yeah. I'm looking. Talk to all your older relatives and neighbors. Who's seen this rock back 30, 50, 70 years ago? And is there a name for it? Okay. 8,000 people drive by it every day. Okay. Nobody knows. Okay. So th those are some native places right uh, just over the line in Swansea that you can see. Also over in, in Swansea uh, behind Town Hall is Abrams Rock, a wonderful place called Village Park back there. It's used by the kids for dirt bikes and stuff all the time. But it's a great place to hike. And they're all, there's Wildcat Rock. There's a whole bunch of these large out, uh, uh, outcroppings there. And, and it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, here's uh, King Philip's seat uh, up at Mount Hope. You can walk there, again, go to the Mount Hope uh, uh, farm and ask for permission, and uh, um, uh, you can walk up there probably better in the summertime than now. And then uh, New Connecticut Hill. Anybody hear of that? Yeah. Where is it? Pardon me? In Johnson. Not quite. Part of, it's, part of it's in Johnson. It's the western border of the city of Providence. I didn't know a thing about it till I got involved in this project. And Helen Jader, who I was telling you about earlier, says, oh, you've got to go to Nudicanca Hill. I said, why? She says, that's a native meeting place. There's rocks up here on the, uh, you walk up a trail and you find this cluster of rocks where tribes people from the Massachusetts, the Nipmuc, the Narragansett, and the Poconoca tribe would gather for intertribal meetings. Very sacred place. And I was up there not long ago. There's a conservancy group that does a, um, an event uh, usually in September. And uh, we had uh, members of the Moshpog tribe. Anybody know them? Start to get to know them. They're in Moshpog Pond. Okay, near, it's almost at the Cranston Line south of Providence. Small tribe, small lake, totally polluted. But that tribe um, was up on Nudaconicut Hill doing a powwow for uh, people in, who were visiting there, doing a drumming session. Um, well, back to home, and I'll wrap up here. Here we are back at Burrs Hill Park. How many people have been over to see the monument there? Not many. Um, what I'm, you know where it is. You know where Burrs Hill Park is, yeah. <laughs> okay? You know where the town beach is, just 
go to the beach, park there, and then walk up the hill at the south end on the grass. And when it flattens out near the top, you will see this monument uh, that was placed there in 2017 by the Mashpee tribe, not the Poconoka tribe, not the Narragansett tribe, and not the Wampan, well, they call themselves the Wampanoag. They, they're the Wampanoag Mashpee. There's Wampanoag Aquina. You know, Wampanoag, you know, it, it, that's the English name for all the Indians who were here. Uh, it, it just, you know, makes no sense. They're, they're the Mashpee tribe. They weren't involved in the King Philip War, by the way. They were neutral, and they were given a reservation because of that, and they were on the side of the English. Um, whereas the Poconoka, who live around here, were not on the side of the English. They were people who wanted the war to happen. So they got an agreement with the town, uh, and uh, it was all done on the up and up. The town donated $15,000 for the project, and uh, they found a place where Charles Carr, who used to sit right over there at that desk in 1913. Why? Why did Charles Carr sit over there? He was the director. He was the library director, right. Uh, and Charles uh, was an amateur archaeologist and was interested in all the things that people were finding. And one of the projects that had started in 1851 was to build a railroad from Providence down to Bristol. Okay, it was the Providence Warren <coughs> Bristol Railroad. And to get there, what we call Burr's Hill Park today. And in the process, they took down some of the embankment there, moved some of that dirt. Remember, you, you, and when you build a railroad, you first put the rails down and then a car on it, and then you put dirt in it, and you move the car, and then you dump the dirt, and you put more rails down, and then you dump the dirt and put more rails down. So you had to have a supply, a steady supply of, of gravel that you could dig out of there. And in 1851, they didn't have steam shovels, so it was all hand digging. So where do you go to get easy gravel and sand? Burr's Hill, which was at the time Burr's Hills, plural, because that whole area was nothing but these little sand mounds, kind of like dunes, okay, that were over there. And bit by bit, and there were trees on much of it, uh, they began digging that out and digging that out. So by the time Charles was here, and these people had been discovering skeletons and bones and pots and one thing or another from that area, he said, I've got to get over there. We've got to get all the rest of the stuff out of there or it'll all be gone. We had no idea how much stuff was looted before that time, but had 50 years to loot it. Um, so he gets permission, uh, summer of 1913, goes in with his friend and digs up 42 grave sites. Okay. Um, he kept a little notebook. I've seen the notebook. It's, a, it's in, uh, at Cornell University Library. Uh, but uh, um, he didn't, you know, he didn't have great technique, let's put it this way. Because he'd say, oh, the grave is 42 degrees from the large oak tree. Yeah. <laughs> well, 100 years later, where's the large oak tree? Um, so we don't know exactly where the graves were. But Susan Gibson, in 1980, published a book. The same year that we moved into our house right next to Bruce Hill, Susan publishes a book on 17th century burial site in Warren, Rhode Island. Uh, she was working with Brown University, and she found the objects that um, Charles had dug up, some of which were just upstairs here, mm -hmm. the little museum room, others that were sent to, uh, to the Heppenrecker, Brown University, some to um, Harvard, we believe, uh, some to the Hay Museum in New York City. So the stuff that came out of Burst Hill went all over the place because it was a great example of native burials. And when native people bury someone, what do you do? It's kind of like the Egyptians. You bury somebody, you, you place objects in the grave that they're going to take with them to the next life. And you want to take, give them the most meaningful and the most valuable objects. So what was he finding but pots and knives and all kinds of English implements, spoons and buckles and lots of beads and pieces of blanket and one thing or another that the Indians had traded so those are the items that Charles Carr uh, dug up from the graves in Burr's Hill, and uh, those are the same items then that the Mashpee tribe uh, recovered over the last 20 years uh, from the various museums, and were able to return them to Burr's Hill 
uh, and uh, reinter them uh, in a crypt in Burr's Hill, uh, there to remain forever. And uh, that uh, really ends the story of Osamequin and uh, the Poconoka tribe at that time. But you should know that the Poconoka tribe continues to this day. There are over 200 members of the tribe who live around this area. And uh, working with the Rhode Island Council on the Humanities, uh, we're going to provide uh, education for uh, children in our schools uh, to teach them that the, the people who lived here for the last 10,000 years continue to live here and continue to contribute uh, to our understanding of uh, what took place over the last 400 years. So I invite you to look at the website, uh, uh, the SolmesHeritageArea.org website, and uh, to see what kinds of things you could do to promote uh, the establishment of, of a national Soames heritage area here, similar to the Blackstone Valley heritage area, uh, that will tell the story of what really took place here over the past 400 years. So I thank you very much for your attention. You've been a great audience, and I look forward to talking to you more about this project in the future.